Okay, so as I recorded this video and the moment that I recorded this video, uh, the Cascadia Derby just finished and it was the Sounders who come out victorious in this Cascadia Derby as they were able to beat Portland on the road, one nothing. And let's actually talk about that match first because since it just ended a couple of seconds ago and what a match it was. Certainly another good Cascadia kind of encounter and certainly it did not disappoint us. Uh, there was a lot of great things that happened in the match. There was a very amazing kind of TIFO display by the Timber Army as usual. This time they decided to go with the IT reference. Um, and there was definitely a lot of chippiness in the game as you can expect from a derby game. And there was also some big moments in the game and probably the biggest moment in this game and probably the turning point of this game was the own goal by Cascade who scored an own goal in the 76th minute and of all people that actually deliver that dangerous ball into the box for the Seattle Sounder it would be Kim Kihi the one that does that he ran all the way across the other side of the pitch to deliver that ball in and Cascada just, you know, he completely got his leg kind of kind of wrong-footed and basically tapped it into his own net. You know, it's very kind of unfortunate in that case. But what's interesting about this game is that I thought for most part of this game, Portland were kind of the better team. And the Sounders kind of really didn't look very threatening on the attack. And especially what happened in the second half they kind of really set back and trying to hit the timbers on the counter attack and the timbers was putting all sorts of pressure on that seattle defense and i thought this the timber were eventually going to get that goal but it just never did happen um they just couldn't quite put that chances away and how many times we have been saying how when you do not take your chances and when you were are the better side and having those chances but you don't put it into the back of the net it will always come back to haunt you and for Portland case it came back to haunt them with this on goal in the 76th minute and you know certainly for the Sounders this is a big win for them because now they're officially above the red line for the first time since last week I mean if you don't even count last week where they were just kind of above the red line for a day because uh, I believe the I think it was RSL had had a game that they had to to play and then RSL of course won that game so that they of course jumped back up but Seattle is now officially above the red line and Portland is now below the red line I mean it is just incredible how Portland just a couple of weeks ago they were in first place and they were having a historic unbeaten streak and now four games later and find themselves in a four game losing streak, they're now below the red line. And I know Portland does have a lot of game in hand and they do play the fewest game out of any opponent in the Western Conference, but they have a lot of games coming up. And I think this is the first game of what would be three in seven days for the Timbers. And the next team that they're gonna be playing, it's Toronto FC. And it's another team that is having kind of a rejuvenated second half and are a team that is fighting for that position in the playoffs. So things are just not going to get easier for Portland. And after that TFC game, they have to fly all the way across the other side of the country to play another team that is desperate to try to get into the playoff, that is New England. And we already know what happened the first time when the Timbers travel all the way across the other side of the country in a short week against DC United. They were very bad, and they looked very tired in that game. So if you're a Timber fan, you know, I get that this is definitely disappointed and that you would think that, yes, even though we're b below the red line, we still have a lot of game in hand and I think they have three games in hand to the team that is above them which is the Galaxy and that gap is only one point but yes you have a lot of games in hand but the thing is those game in hand come thick 
and fast and those game in hands are against teams that is very very good are and are really hungry to try to get a win so in conclusion i think portland could be finding themselves in a very sticky situation and could be in a bit of trouble right now consider of where they stand right now and like i said i never thought this was gonna happen to the timbers i mean i get the timbers had a had a big kind of kind of stretch where they had to to play a lot of games do it in a short terms of short span of period and they had to play against some tough team but at the end of the day that's what happened when you didn't play a lot of games in the earlier of the season because they had a lot of off day games because of that that uh stadium kind of expansion that they have to do but yeah it is going to be interesting to see what the timbers will be in these next couple of weeks and you would think if this losing streak continues for the timber then there has to be some panic button smashing from the timbers fan base i mean they there is a very big possibility that this team could potentially miss the playoffs even though they that had that historic 15 game unbeaten streak and as for the sounders there is no doubt that this team is making the playoffs i mean this team i think the only the one thing that i i'm going to, to say is the reason why this team is having once again a rejuvenated second half of the season and they're doing their annual second half comeback is that this team always find a way to score a goal and win and tonight it's been proven again where somehow in some way they kind of got lucky with this goal but they find a way to sustain that pressure from portland and they were able to have one good chance. Well, they had a couple of chances. I think Rui Diaz could have maybe made it 2 nothing right at stoppage time if it wasn't for Cascande tackle him literally at the last minute. Uh, but Seattle just, they always find a way to score goals. And when you look at the goals that they have scored and the way that they, they're able to find a way to score those goals, it has not been pretty whatsoever. But hey, it doesn't matter at the end of the day if it's pretty or not. As long as you find a way to score goals and as long as you find a way to grind out resort, then nobody would really care about how it is going to be. So, yeah, with the Sounders, of course, moving up above the red line and the Timbers moving down below the red line, you know, certainly now it's going to be pretty interesting and I'm pretty sure if you're a Galaxy fan, and even though the Galaxy are not in this, you are probably shitting yourself right now too. I mean, the Galaxy are just only one point above Portland, and even though I said about how Portland has all these game in hand and they have to play against tough team in those stretch, yeah, yeah, what if Portland does win those games and that you could potentially find yourself below the red line? Uh, but either way, Moving on and talking about the remaining six game, and we'll start with the Philly versus New England game where the Union were probably the biggest winner in terms of the playoff race in the Eastern Conference because they were the only team besides TFC in, in the teams that is behind them that were able to get a win. Um, they won this game one nothing from from New England uh, the only goal in this game co come from Corey Burke and it was a bit of a controversial goal because what happened during this incident was that originally they said that this goal was supposed to be offside and that the linesman actually raised his flag and Corey Burke just kept going thinking that the linesman didn't raise his flag and by the way the whistle actually didn't even blow at this incident and he just kind of kept going and eventually he scored the goal. Uh, New England just completely stopped playing when the, the flag was raised by the linesman. And when they look at VAR, it turns out that that goal was not offside. And that that goal did stand from Corey Burke. And I understand if you're a Revs fan, you're going to be very pissed off the fact that, you know, the referee probably should have blown his whistle when the linesman has his his flag up and stuff like that but at the end of the day you know there's this classic cliche about how you always need to play to the whistle and that if the whistle hasn't been blown you shouldn't 
be able to stop playing and I think in this case that is something that the Rebs should have learned and that I feel like they shouldn't have have stopped playing I feel like they, they got even though the, the linesman raised his flag you know you don't know if he raised his flag by accident I feel like they should have kept playing and if they did kept playing maybe they could have avoided that goal but having said that they did actually look at VAR and you know, I haven't really took a good second look of that goal to see whether or not if that was offside or not. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys can let me know in the comments below what do you think of that. Was Corey Burke actually onside? But at the end of the day, this is a massive win for Philly and for New England. You know, yeah, I think you are done in terms of the playoff hunt. I mean, this is the second week in a row where you had a six-pointer against a team that you are fighting for those last two playoff spots, and both times you lose. And in this game, the story of this game wasn't because of the fact that they gave up that goal, but the story of this game is the fact that they just could not finish. Like, they had so many chances in the second half to equalize, and granted... Andre Blake was kind of on his game and he was saving a lot of big shots. But at the end of the day, you got to put the ball into the back of the lane. You got to take your chances. And they didn't. And that is exactly why they lost this game. And for New England, this winless run just continues for them. And I just think with how things are going for New England and how they have a very brutal stretch in September, I just think this team is done. Like... This these two games against Philly and DC are the games that if they want to potentially still be in the hunt of potentially making the playoffs, these two games they have to win. But because they lost both of the game, I just think they're done in, because of the way that their form is in and the tough schedule that they had. And yeah, I mean, I I guess. It's kind of disappointed that New England has kind of started to fall apart. But at the end of the day, I go back to what I said in the beginning of the season of how I didn't think this team was potentially going to make the playoffs. And I thought maybe when they did play very well earlier in the season, it looked like they were kind of overachieving. And that once now they're back down to earth and they're kind of like playing as what we sort of expected you saw how now New England is kind of struggling and how they are falling down the table. Uh, but meanwhile, moving on and speaking of a team that um, I just mentioned about Philly and the team below them and that the only team below them was able to get a resort is TFC. Toronto got a resort against Montreal. Um, they won this one 3-1. Uh, all the goals actually came in the first... 30 minutes and actually this goal by Jonathan Osorio actually scoring the 28th minute but all three goals or all four goals in this game scored by both team were were in the first 30 minute um, and then in the first 25 minute it was the classic Sebastian Javanko show with him getting a brace and Jonathan Osorio scoring to make it 3-1 or 3 nothing at that point uh, Silva did pull one back and Montreal actually had a couple of decent chances of potentially make this game even more interesting. I, I know they also hit the bar right before halftime. And in the second half, they were putting all sorts of pressure against this TFC team. And I just think that this TFC midfield looked really, really sloppy. Uh, especially Michael Brett in that second half. He looked very, very bad in that second half. And Montreal could have potentially got back into this game but like I said about New England they didn't take their chances and that is the reason why they lost this game and for Montreal you know this is definitely not a good loss and in some way there has to be a lot of concern if you're an impact fan because one even though you're above the red line right now and that you have I believe a four point gap over New England you do have two games uh, well, New England actually have two games in hand of Montreal and that the Impact have played the most game out of those six teams that is fighting for those last two spots in the Eastern Conference. And, you know, 
I'm pretty sure teams like DC United will definitely look at that and think that they still have an opportunity to potentially chase them down even though DC United are still seven points back and that they did lose in this week game but for Montreal they got to know that you know even though they are going to play some of these good teams coming up in the schedule they got to win those games if they want to stay in that sixth spot and you know I I kind of been I don't think I've been kind of mentioning before in my review or my preview but I always feel like Montreal were probably most likely the one that could drop below the red line and that that is going to be the team that somebody below the red line will be replaced them mainly because they have played the most game out of those those bunch that is fighting for the playoffs and the fact that Montreal tends to not do very well against team that is very good so yeah I mean I don't know we'll, we'll see how how it's gonna go from the end of the season we'll see if some of the teams below can potentially catch Montreal because I think with Philly of how good they've been recently and how they they're starting to get into a rhythm i think now it's just not just two spot that is up for grabs it's now just down to one spot and that is that six spot and i think you see teams like dc united and tfc are just really chasing for those spot and if i have to put a bet on which team can potentially replace montreal in that six spot i would say tfc would do it mainly because of the fact that tfc does have um i wouldn't say a favorable schedule but dc united with all those home games and all of how bunched up it is you know i don't know if they're going to they're gonna do very well on that and tfc definitely have more quality than what dc united does have so yeah i would favorite tfc potentially be the one that replaced montreal in that sixth spot uh, but moving on into the next match, uh, Sporting KC, of course, winning 2 nothing over Minnesota. Goals in this game, Johan Corze in the 48th, Diego Rubio in the 62nd, and there's really not much I need to talk about this much other than the fact that Sporting KC has now almost gone 400 minutes without conceding a goal. And this was a team that, you know, a month and two months ago, I was kind of panicking about them potentially having a FC Dallas kind of type of collapse with the way that they've been losing game. But it felt like this team finally started to pick up and that the defense is now back to what you kind of expect a Peter Vermees kind of defense looks like. And now that they they have not conceded a goal in a very long time. But, you know, I kind of expected Sporting KC was going to win this one. I mean, when you look at this match, Everybody would have said that Sporting KC was going to win this because they're playing against Minnesota. And I think in some way this game was kind of over when the starting 11 was announced by both teams. And that when Minnesota didn't announce Darwin Quintero in the starting 11, everybody knew it was over. Like this Minnesota team without Darwin Quintero is just nothing really. And it just kind of show in this one and you know Minnesota did try to kind of like park the bus in this game and try to make it hard for Sporting KC to score a goal which they did pretty well for the first 45 minutes but eventually when they did gave up the goal that was a moment where you would you would think that it's pretty much over for Minnesota and that their parking the bus strategy goes out of the window when they down one nothing and when they down two nothing you know it's over pretty much uh but yeah moving on and wow holy crap colorado nothing rsl six this is known as the the rocky mountain massacre and in many ways i kind of felt sorry for rapids fan and i'm i'm gonna be honest i feel like all those rapids fan that went to this match needs to get a refund after this one because holy crap the rapids was absolutely horrendous and yes it didn't help the fact that they did had two men send off in the first half which you know the first sending off you know i will say that it's kind of a red card 
but in some way I kind of would debate that maybe that's not a red card because yes Nicky Jackson did kind of headbutt Albert Ruth's neck there but it doesn't look like Jackson really kind of did a very kind of big contact of a headbutt over Ruth's neck and headbutts has been a topic that we've been always talking about in MLS for the last couple of seasons. I mean, I feel like ever since the headbutt that Joseph Martinez did a couple of weeks ago, and then we had the Raul Rui Diaz headbutt a couple of weeks against FC Dallas, you know, headbutts has been kind of the main talking point and how referee are letting player getting away with those headbutts. And, you know, when you look at this one, I think... Out of the three incidents, I think this one was probably the least malicious. Uh, it was just basically a little tap of the head from Nicky Jackson to Albert Ruth's neck. And, you know, at the end of the day, it is still a headbutt. And usually when that happens, it's definitely a straight red. But at the same point, or at the same time, it's not really a, a very kind of, kind of, malicious kind of headbutt and I just kind of feel like it's a little bit soft in terms of this red card but you know it's just it feels like this debate is just going to continue on and on about the headbutt issue and how it feels like it's kind of inconsistent with some big players tend to get away with it and then you have this incident where Nicky Jackson just barely kind of touched Albert Ruth's neck in this head in this headbutt incident and he got sent off by that and then of course the second sending off yes that's definitely a sending off I mean Boateng basically just kind of went studs up and took out that RSL player and yeah that is a hundred percent a red car and really at that point when Colorado was down to nine men you know that is pretty much the, the moment where they pretty much just gave up like the second half the Rapids pretty much didn't even bother showing up. They probably were still in the locker room in the second half because RSL absolutely ran riots in the second half. Um, and by the way, the goal scorer for RSL, uh, Krylak in the sixth minute, uh, Savarino in the 33rd and 58th, Plata in the 69th, Corey Bear in the 74th, and Albert Rusnak in the 86th. And there could have been a seven goal right at stoppage time, but it was ruled offside, which on the replay, it definitely was not offside. But at the end of the day, I think 6 nothing is kind of what you expected. And yeah, I mean, like I said, I feel sorry for Rapids fan in this match because I think before this massacre and this implosion at Dick Sporting Goods, I really think the Rapids has been playing very well. I mean, in these last couple of games, even in the game that they lost against LAFC, they actually look very, very decent. And, you know, I think the only reason why um, in that LAFC game, why the Rapids wasn't able to get anything out of it, despite they played pretty well, is that they really just did not have any real goal scored on their team. And, you know, I... Again, I felt sorry for them. And, you know, with this incident, you could maybe say that somebody must be be under a lot of scrutiny and pretty much under fire after this resort. And I think most likely the, the guy that is going to be under fire after this, this resort has to be Anthony H Hudson. And i already been hearing that Rapids fan have already started to call out Hudson and want him to... to be sacked and you know it will be interesting to see if he's going to get sacked and heck if Hudson does get sacked then it just makes even a stronger point for me as a Quakes fan to really just call out our front office and saying that we should sack Star Hate right away because when you see other organization with you know Orlando City already done it with Jason Christ and then potentially maybe the Rapids gonna do it with Anthony Hudson why in the world are we still waiting and and not pull the the trigger to finally sack our manager that is completely incompetent and speaking of the Quakes that's what I'm gonna be talking about next and from the massacre of Dick's Sporting Goods to the collapse of Avaya Stadium I mean 
the Quakes was 2-0 up in this game. Everything was happy. Everyone think that could this be finally the day that we finally end this miserable streak? I definitely think it was. And I even thought of it in the pre-game. And when we were up 2-0, I thought for sure that this is it. We're going to finally end it. That we're going to finally get our first win since March. But little do we know that that kind of optimism and in classic Quakes fa fashion, any optimism you show, they will crush you, you in a matter of seconds. And in this case, it wasn't a matter of seconds, but it's in a matter of nine minutes of us just conceding three goals and losing 3-2 in this game. Uh, Jordi Reyna in the 59th, Christian Teixeira in the 61st, and Kai Kamara in the 68th. Nine minutes, that is all it took for the Whitecaps to literally storm back and even take the lead. And from then on, we just had absolutely no answer. Like, as soon as we went down 3-2, the team looked completely deflated. And, yeah, I mean, like I said in my match vlog, as much as when you see this result, it's very disappointing and it must make you very kind of it must make me very upset seeing the team go from leading two nothing to losing three two in a span of just nine minutes but at the end of the day this is what i kind of expect from this team this team is just completely giving up this season this team the players on this team are clearly not not playing for the shirt and doesn't even care anymore and it's pretty clear that the 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 whole club is in such a turmoil right now from the players, the manager, and also in the front office. And now even in the fan base too. I mean, I even mentioned it right at the end of the match vlog where there was actually a fight that broke down in the ultras. I mean, yeah. What else can I have to say about this team that I haven't said before? It just feels like I keep repeating myself every single week with this team. Which is why that I also want to make an announcement and said that on the on the game that's going to happen on Wednesday against FC Dallas, because we still have a very quick turnaround after this game, but that game against FC Dallas, I am not going. I actually just sold my tickets, and if you want to, of course, claim my ticket, be sure to... Do it on Ticketmaster. Uh, my seat is section 124, row 7, seat 5. But I sold my ticket because I'm not going because I'm tired of this bullshit and that it is really time to boycott this team. Like, I am not going to see the same shit over and over again. And what I'm also going to do is that I'm still going to watch the game, but I'm going to watch it on TV and I'm also going to do a stream on Wednesday but I'm gonna call it the live match reaction boycott edition because that is what I'm gonna do in this game but yeah moving on into the final game that I'm gonna be talking about this weekend uh, the Red Bulls with a 1-0 win against DC United uh, Kaku with a goal of the week nomination kind of goal in the 56th minute and that is all it separates from both of these teams and Really, I think this was a matchup between two teams that is incredibly tired. And it kind of shown in the second half with the Red Bulls, which is kind of hanging on for dear life for that one nothing win and trying to grind it, it out. And DC United, you know, themselves were also getting very tired to try to find that equalizer. And the fact that they play so many games in these last couple of weeks, you know, it kind of show, showed... In that second half and you know I really think at the end of the day the Red Bulls will definitely be very happy that they were able to grind out a one nothing resort and keep pace with Atlanta uh, but as for DC United this is definitely a very frustrating resort because you know I get that they are coming into this game having played a whole bunch of games in these last couple of weeks but having said that they probably could have maybe got a draw or even got 
a point out of this game. And if they got a point out of this game, then it would be a massive, massive point. But because of this loss, this just puts more pressure on them in these next couple of weeks. And keep in mind, these next couple of weeks, they, they're going to be playing a lot of games too in these next couple of weeks. But yeah, that is pretty much it for the review of this match week. Let me know in the comments below what do you think of this match week. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I, of course, will be doing my power rankings tomorrow and also preview the two games that's going to happen in the midweek. And there's going to be no Quakes preview this week because, you know, it's just, it's so hard to talk about the Quakes for a long span of period after what I just saw this weekend and also throughout this season but yeah hope you guys enjoyed this video if you do make sure you guys leave a like smash that subscribe button and yeah i of course will see you guys next time